So before I get started, the question I have is how many of you in here today are familiar with Albion or have used any products that contain Albion minerals in your practices? Long time or recent or? Yeah, okay, great. Well, Albion is a, is a company that's dedicated to mineral science. The company was started in uh, 1956 by a gentleman named Harvey Ashmead. Uh, Harvey, prior to Albion, was a biochemist with Pfizer. And the whole impetus for Albion, we originally started as a veterinary and pharmaceutical company. So a lot of the early development with the chelated minerals, which is pretty much on par with everything else, is animal study related. And one thing that we found during all this work up to the human products division is that um, the animals, uh, when they were taking a common mineral salt that was used in feed or anything like that, was basically in one end and out the other. So there was very little absorption of the minerals. So what happened is Harvey uh, developed a program and a process to, at that time, uh, make a chelate. Uh, the first chelate that he made was something that was very crude, which was basically a hydrolyzed protein with a, with a mineral salt, which as we know today, it's an admixture, it's not a chelate. So then we developed a process where we actually extracted uh, single free-form aminos from a hydrolyzed protein, and then reacted that to a, a mineral salt to make an actual chelate structure. So that's how we all got started uh, and moved on from there. Um, as amino acids became predominant in the marketplace, you know, 40 years ago, uh, then we were able to start buying free-form minerals, amino acids, to make the mineral chelates, which greatly enhanced our production opportunities and the ability for us to create more chelate uh, ingredients, you know, down the road. So basically, Albion, uh, as we stand today, um, we have a, a new owner. In February, we were bought by a company called Balchem. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Balchem as a company. Uh, their claim to fame is Vitacholine. And so what they figured with us is we had a lot of similar characteristics and same type of customers that we sell to. So there's a lot of commonality there. So we expect great things in the future, not only from Albion, but from Balchem as we work together with what we manufacture and what they make and complement everything. Okay. All right, so as we get started today, uh, the thing to understand is what exactly is a mineral chelate? This is the structure of a mineral chelate. The M in the middle is a mineral. It could be anything. It could be magnesium, copper, zinc. It could be calcium. And what you see on either side is a bicyclic structure. That is the amino acid that is bound to the mineral. So basically what happens when we make a mineral chelate, we're taking a, a um, form of mineral that's in the salt and we're creating a dipeptide protein molecule. So the structure is a bisglycinate chelate with one glycine on either side with the mineral as a closing member of the structure function of the molecule. Oh, going the wrong way. Back in the, the mid 90s, there was a group that was put together by the NNFA. This group is now called the Natural Products Association. And, and you know, at that time, there was a lot of uh, mis misconception of what exactly is a chelated mineral. So this was a group that was made up of many people that were involved in the industry, some that uh, claimed to make chelates, and of course Albion was part of this group. So the de definition of what a chelate mineral is, is a product resulting from the reaction of a metal ion from a soluble metal salt with an amino acid of a molar ratio of one mole of metal to one to, uh, one to three, preferably two moles of amino acid to form coordinate covalent bonds. Now the one thing that's wrong with, with this statement is that when you have a one-to-one -one ratio mole, it's not a chelate, it's a complex. And we'll get more into that with some of the other products that we make that we do call complexes. So this is not accurate as far as an industry definition of what a chelate is. What a chelate is, is a two moles of the amino acid, at least two moles to one mole of the mineral. The other thing that's important about a chelated mineral is that there's a weight uh, limitation also. The average molecular weight of the hydrolyzed amino acids must be about 150 atomic mass units. That's the weight of each amino acid on either side of the mineral. And then the resulting weight of the structure cannot exceed 800 atomic mass units. The reason for that is if the molecule is much larger than that, once it gets ingested and gets into the stomach, it's gonna go through an ionization process where the body's gonna try to break it down to a smaller molecule so that when it passes through the stomach into the intestinal tract for absorption, 
uh, it'll be at a size that the body can tolerate. So the minimum elemental metal content is declared uh, as a chelate. Um, in the case, an example of copper, copper we make is a 10% elemental copper, and the actual structural name is a copper bisglycinate chelate. When it's called amino acid chelate, that's just basically a generic term, and it doesn't really tell you what is the structure of that particular molecule. What is an amino acid chelate? Uh, the chelation occurs when the cation M, which would be the mineral in the middle of the structure there, is held by ionic and coordinate covalent bonds from the same molecule. We use glycine more than anything in creating a chelate structure, and the reason why glycine is very well tolerated by the body and it's also a very low molecular weight, so it works very well when we have the weight considerations and what it needs to be to stay in the chelate structure. The ligand backbone isolates the cation from reactions with other compounds. Two amino acids can chelate a single polyvalent cation resulting in a bicyclic dipeptide-like structure. So basically, getting back to the dipeptide, the body won't, when it ingests this, thinks it's a protein. This will resist gastric acid hydrolysis and intestinal enzyme cleavage. The metals in these chelates are typically absorbed through an active transport at the jejunal dipeptide absorptive site. So it's going to go through the stomach into the intestinal tract, and they're going to be absorbed at different sites. So they're not all competing for absorption into one cell. That is common with the mineral salts. When such a chelate is ingested, intestinal uptake is significantly greater than for corresponding amounts of ingested inorganic mineral salts. Salts would be chlorides, carbonates, oxides, um, sulfates, things like that. So Rick, is it safe to say when they're chelated in this manner that your body absorbs them or identifies them more as a protein? Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, what we've done is we've created a dipeptide. And what's other, what else is unique about this structure is that because it's, the stability of the chelate is also very important. If the bond is, is too weak, then there's a chance that it could disassociate into stomach acid but then if the bond is too strong, once it gets through the stomach into the cells for absorption, then it may not disassociate properly once it gets transverses through the cell into the bloodstream. A few things that make Albion's mineral chelate stand out. Uh, over the years, we have uh, been uh, granted over 150 patents in the field of mineral technology. This not only includes human nutrition, but also we are really big in foliar nutrition and also anything that we've done in the animal field, which is where we started. Um, our Albion chelates have been the only chelates that have been given CAS registration numbers. Uh, what this is, is this is more like an identity testing or a verification of what you actually make is what you say it is, and this is done through the American Chemical Society. Our Albion chelates are all kosher, they're all halal certified, so if anybody has any dietary limitations, it's safe for everybody to take. Uh, Albion chelates have been chemically validated and consequently the only known chelates that meet the definition of the NNFA, which is now the MPA. And then basically all the research ever published on a chelated mineral has been done using our mineral. Now this is research that we've either funded or sent out or somebody has gotten samples of our material and conducted research on their own. This gives you an idea of just some of the articles that we have over the years uh, as far as different studies. Uh, this one here, LD50 studies, we've done studies on every one of our chelates to determine what is a safe upper limit as far as any toxicity issues. LD50 is where we use rats. LD stands for lethal dose, where 50% of the animals survive or die, so that's important. Um, a lot of the studies that we've done over the years, you'll see ones here for iron. This talks about hemoglobin iron deficiency anemia, and there's another one over there of tolerability versus a ferrous sulfate. Our ferricol iron, if you have any experience with Albion, you may have used that material at one point in time uh, in your practices with patients. Uh, that's really our cornerstone of everything that we've done. That's used domestically in uh, nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals, and it's also used internationally in food fortification around the world. What makes Albion chelate so effective? Well, first of all, they have a molecular weight of under 800 daltons, proper size. So they're not going to ionize or go through any processing in the stomach. They're going to pass through and be absorbed intact. Second of all, they're elect electrically neutral, non-ionizing, less reactive. What happens with a mineral? If you have a mineral salt, um, typically they have a valence to them. It could be as much as a plus two. So when we make a chelate structure, going back to the first side of the picture with the M and then the amino acids on either side, 
When we bond an amino acid to the mineral, we're neutralizing the charge. So that's what enables it to go through the stomach intact and go through an active digestion process versus going through a passive process. So we have a proper stability constant, stays intact in the absorptive gut area, and it's an easy metabolized ligand, better nutrient density. Again, that ligand in most cases is glycine. This will give you an idea of an easily metabolized ligand and the benefits of it. The example that we have here is zinc. On the left, we have our zinc uh, amino acid chelate, which is our bisglycinate chelate. This is a 20% elemental zinc product. So you'll see the three components of this are the amino acid, water, H2O, which is a residual of the processing, and of course, the elemental value of the zinc. When you look at the picolinate on the other side, you have 21% zinc and 79% picolinic acid. So when you look at our product, as far as nutrient density, it's 100%. What that means is the body is going to utilize all three of those components as it passes through the system and through absorption. Whereas something like a zinc picolinate, only being 21% elemental zinc, only has a 21% nutrient density. Similar to that, when you look at calcium, calcium carbonate is 40% elemental, calcium carbonate has a 40% neutral uh, nutritional density to it. Because of inherent reactivity of metal ions, mineral ions, mineral deficiencies are common, and the absorption interfering problems are, of course, dietary proteins. You know, a lot of people take their supplements in the morning. You know, they may take uh, any, anywhere from two to four tablets every morning or capsules. Uh, so if they take it with a meal, whether it's oatmeal or, or whatever, uh, there may be some uh, dietary interactions. Um, the other thing is the, the correct pH, you know, what's going to help that product uh, be stable and move through the uh, absorption process. And also any precipitating anions, phosphates, phytates, oxalates, fats, will all hinder the absorption of minerals. So if you're dealing with any, anybody, any patients that are di or vegetarians rather, um, where they, you know, they have a problem with phytates and oxalates that may be more common in their type of diet, um, they won't block the absorption of the minerals in a, in a true chelate structure. And then the other thing is mineral competition. Our minerals do not compete for absorption. Once they get into the intestinal tract, they absorb at different sites. This will give you an idea here why minerals are important. Uh, what we're looking at here is the different uh, systems in the body, everything from immune to reproduction. It'll give you an idea, for instance, immune, copper, zinc, iron and selenium are important, and then down for reproduction, phosphorus, copper, potassium, manganese, zinc, and magnesium are all important. Minerals basically activate the coenzymes in the body. When you're looking at zinc and looking at magnesium, you have about 500 uh, metalloenzymes that are reacted in the body to help the absorption of not only minerals but also uh, other, other nutrients that are associated with the diet. A comparison of mineral nutrients, there's many sources of uh, minerals to choose from. Amino acid chelates, sulfates, carbonates, picolinates, so-called Krebs cycle, uh, rice bran chelates. How do you know which mineral is best? What we look at is we look at each mineral category and we determine the quality of it based on bioavailability, and GI tolerance, and safety. Um, one thing that's known is that iron, particularly in a salt form, and magnesium uh, in high doses, therapeutic doses, can be very upsetting to the stomach. So a lot of people may not uh, be religious to a protocol that you may put them on with a mineral salt. Uh, so when you take a look at the Albion chelates, because they're a protein, a diprotein, dipeptide protein structure, we have good bioavailability, we have really good GI tolerance, and of course the safety based on the LD50s we've done is very good on it also. So in comparison to the common salts, there's a difference in bioavailability where it's poor or adequate, same thing with GI tolerance and safety, and then all, on, all down the line from gluconates, citrates, picolinates, into so-called bran chelates, which are admixtures, uh, there's a difference in bioavailability, glucose tolerance, GI tolerance and safety. And then the bottom one here, Krebs cycle, there are some companies that develop what they call Krebs cycle chelates, but what these actually are is a chain of mineral salts that they're blending together, typically five or six of them. And what they, what they compare that with is any organic acids that are existing in the Krebs cycle in the body, and they claim that because there's a commonality there, there'll be a better absorption. That's not, not the case. 
This is another study here, looking again at the LD50s and the toxicology of a chelate compared to mineral salts. When you're looking at here, we're looking at copper, iron, chromium, manganese, and zinc, and you'll pretty much see across the board at least a two to one uh, ratio as far as safety with a chelate versus a common mineral salt. So this is something that's very important, particularly in thera therapeutic dosages, uh, more so with, uh, with macro minerals more than anything. Absorbability of chemically defined calcium sources. This is something that's really interesting. A lot of people take different forms of calcium. You know, some of the more common ones that we find, particularly in the practitioner market, are hydroxyapatite, citrate, calcium citrate malate, and of course our bisglycinate chelate does very well in this market also. But the thing that people don't understand is if you have a thousand milligram RDI of a calcium, exactly how much of that material is your body going to use? So when you're looking at the second one here, calcium hydroxyapatite, when you look at the fractional absorption, even without a meal, it's about 17%. So out of 1,000 milligrams of calcium ingested, 100% of the RDI, your body's going to utilize about 170. When you're looking at calcium carbonate, there is a little bit of benefit with that when you take it with a meal. But without a meal, the basic absorption of calcium carbonate is about 23%. So out of 1,000 milligrams of 100% of the RDI, your body's going to utilize about 230 milligrams. When you get down to calcium citrate, it's a little bit better than carbonate, but the base material in that is a carbonate. So the absorption characteristics are a little bit better. Uh, they're basically 24, 25%. And then further on down the, the chain here, calcium citrate malate, which is a material that we make also. This is something that we originally made for Procter & Gamble. What that is is a six to two to three molar ratio of calcium to citric acid to malic acid. And the studies that have been un done on that show a 36% absorption, which is very good for a non-chelate form of the mineral. And of course, at the bottom is our bisglycinate chelate calcium, and this is 44% bioavailable. So you can see across the board there, the chelate form of the calcium is in most cases almost two to one what the, the mineral salt would be uh, of a comparing ion of calcium. This is another chart that kind of illustrates that. This, is, this was a study done by Dr. Robert Heaney at Creighton University. Uh, he's done a lot of work for us over the years. He passed away a couple months ago. But at the time, he was the foremost researcher on calcium in the United States. So what he looked at in this study for us in 1990 was basically five forms of calcium, calcium carbonate, calcium from milk, our chelate, calcium from citrate, and then from hydroxyapatite. So you can see across the spectrum there, uh, of course, the chelate being a dipeptide structure and being more stable and bioavailable has a higher uh, absorption rate. Uh, and the thing that's interesting here is that milk calcium at 27% is even better than supplementing with a carbonate or a citrate. So I guess, I guess milk does your body some good. This is a study here looking at zinc absorption. What we're looking at here is our zinc bisglycinate chelate in the blue. Then we have a zinc citrate and a zinc picolinate. As you can see, the zinc citrate does pretty well. Uh, the chelate is still better as a dipeptide molecule, but uh, a picolinic acid form of a mineral is not very well absorbed. You can make a chelate with it, but it's not, not common to the body. Uh, a study was done on this a couple of years ago at Ohio State University that was funded by the manufacturers of zinc picolinate. What they did was is they had four minerals in the study. They had zinc leuconate, they had zinc oxide, they had zinc picolinate, and they said, oh, by the way, let's put the Albion zinc bisglycinate chelate in there. So at the end of the day, the result of the study was something that wasn't published because it was not necessarily usable. So what happened was is out of the four forms of the zinc, the worst one was zinc leuconate. Second from the bottom was picolinate. Zinc oxide was better than picolinate, and of course, our zinc bisglycinate chelate, as far as characteristics of absorption, were better than all four of them. This here talks about magnesium. We've got four different forms of magnesium here. The one on the left is our magnesium bisglycinate chelate. Then we have magnesium carbonate, magnesium sulfate, and magnesium oxide. Um, oxide is very much a common form of magnesium used in dietary supplements. And the main reason for that is because it's very high elemental. It's 52% magnesium. So you can see from a dosage standpoint and a cost per serving or dosage, it's going to be very low. 
On the flip side of that, because of the structure of a chelate and the size and the weight limitation, our bisglycinate chelate is only 10% magnesium elemental value. But when you look at the comparison of these four forms, you can see quite a bit, quite a bit of difference as far as the absorption characteristics of these particular products. This is a comparison of copper. We make a copper bisglycinate chelate. And what they looked at in this slide here was uh, cupric oxide, copper sulfate, and copper carbonate. Uh, the sulfate and the carbonate are more common in, in uh, clinical applications. Um, copper oxide is not necessarily the preferred form in supplementation. We'll see a little bit more copper citrate and something like that. But uh, in looking at this here, our bisglycinate chelate form of copper was over three, three times more bioavailable than these other forms of copper. This slide here looks at chromium absorption. Um, chromium is an interesting mineral. There's many different forms. There's been many, a lot of research done on chromium. But when you look at the different forms of chromium, what is the best as far as absorption? This was a study that we did on uh, animals up at the University of Guelph in Ontario. What we looked at here was uh, chromium chloride, which is a common salt form, or chromium picolinate, chromium polynicotinate, in our tracks, chromium, or chromium nicotinate glycinate chelate. Now, the thing about chromium that's interesting is this is a molecule that is a three to one ratio chelate because chromium is trivalent. When we make a chelate structure, we have to cover all of those electrons. So the molecular structure of this is a dinicotinate, two moles of nicotinic acid to one mole of glycine. Looking again at, at chromium uh, blood serum counts, this was again the study that we did up in Canada. Uh, this looks at chromium chloride, chromium picolinate in our tracks, chromium, uh, chromium nicotinate glycinate chelate. And what we're looking at here is the one hour versus two hour retention times. And you can see that um, there's more, more of a duration of chromium from our tracks versus the, the picolinate form or the common salt of chromium chloride. Picolinates are absorbed but not metabolized. These mineral chelates are eliminated intact in the urine without being used by the body. You can make a chelate with picolinic acid, but it's not the best form to deliver a mineral to the intestines for absorption. Are there antagonisms between minerals that affect nutrition responses? This is what we call a mineral wheel. This is kind of interesting because we have all the minerals on the outside. At the top you have phosphorus. When you're looking at particularly common mineral salts, phosphorus pretty much interacts with every mineral for absorption. So for instance, if there's a formulation out there that uses a, a dicalcium phosphate or tricalcium phosphate, and it's in the high amount, then if there's any other common mineral salts in there, for instance, when you look at the relationship between phosphorus and calcium in the red, or you look at iron and phosphorus, you can see that there's gonna be an antagonism there where the arrows are pointing against each other. Simply ask the following questions. Okay, how does one evaluate albion chelates against the other mineral forms in the marketplace, which also talk of availability? Are the minerals, first of all, are they truly chelated to amino acids or just complex by mixing trace minerals with protein? The things that we compete against more than anything in the marketplace is companies that claim to make a chelate either using a mineral salt, like a mag oxide, and blending it with a glycine. All they're doing is blending two things together. There's no bond, there's no reaction. Or in other instances where they're taking a hydrolyzed vegetable protein or a hydrolyzed animal protein and blending that with a mineral salt, claiming that's a chelate also. Again, those are admixtures. Now, one of the downsides of a hydrolyzed uh, protein material is that when they do the hydrolysis, the glutamine amino is gonna to convert to the salt form, which is monosodium glutamate. So from a, from a um, a process of, of taking a supplement, why would you want to have an MSG as part of the equation? Rick, will you see these typically uh, labeled as glycinate or amino acid chelate? How we, we, see them, we see them labeled as glycinate, you know, and that's why, you know, when you look at our products that are in the marketplace and what we're going to be doing with Nutritional Frontiers, the structural name on there will say bisglycinate chelate. So, you know, everybody knows, you know, that's what the correct chelate's going to be. 
we don't simply list it as a glycinate. Now, the one mineral that we do list as a glycinate is molybdenum. And the reason why they decided to do that is because the actual molar ratio is 2.8 to 1. So it's almost a, a trivalent. So for whatever reason, they said, let's just call this a glycinate. But actually, it is a bisglycinate structure. So that's the difference there. And then the other ones, um, using the hydrolyzed proteins, we'll simply just call them amino acid chelates. But they're not necessarily defining in the supplement facts panel what it's bound to or what the ligand is in that product. Where with ours, it'll say based on what the amino acid is, whether it's glycine or arginine or something like that. Yeah, the logo we use for you guys is TRAX, the real amino acid chelate. TRAX is the real amino acid chelate system, correct. Other questions, does the product have stability when subjected to various pH ranges found in digestion? Going back to the digestion, since the chelates are stable and they're in a dipeptide structure, they will get through the acidity of the stomach and they are designed to be absorbed in the alkalinity of the intestinal tract. This has been predominant for us, particularly in the uh, gastric bypass market where when people have a complete bypass and are going right through the stomach and into the intestines, our minerals are designed to be absorbed in the intestines. So we do very well with those companies in formulating products. Does the product have test data to show it really works? Not many of them do. Is it expensive? Uh, chelates are more expensive than your common mineral salts. The other thing is, getting back to the example I gave with magnesium, which is 52% elemental, where ours is 10%, you're gonna have a, quite a difference in the dosage uh, of the material itself. So it will be a little bit more expensive to formulate with these products, but the end result is a better delivery system and more bioavailability of the mineral. What proof is there of the greater bioavailability of albion chelated minerals? Uh, virtually all the clinical research done on a chelated mineral has been with an albion material. Uh, we've chemically validated everything. This goes through our, our cash registration numbers. When we originally developed the first chelates, we used x-ray uh, crystallography to create uh, a system where we could identify that it was a true chelate bond being made. And what this involves is actually developing a crystal and then analyzing that crystal, which is very time consuming and very expensive. Uh, we've also done nuclear magnetic resonance spect spectroscopy with it. And then the latest one here, C, FTIR, we developed a testing method about five years ago. It took us three years to put it together that uh, we sent out to, um, for third-party validation to AOAC, and uh, that is patented. So whenever we do an FTIR, we basically have a fingerprint or a layover that we can also look at the starting materials we're using and then what the finished product is where everything's gonna match up. Okay, companies uh, legally claim to manufacture amino acid chelates when in fact chemical analysis proves that they are not chelates at all. We test everything in the marketplace that we, we compete against, whether it's made in the United States or made in India or made in China, uh, we look at everything. We sell around the world, we're in about 60 countries right now. And so, you know, we do our best to protect our business out there. What this is here, this is the FTIR analysis of our calcium bisglycinate chelate versus another form made by another company that they're claiming to be a chelate. So what happens is when we do an FTIR, like I said, we'll be able to look at the starting material for the calcium and then the amino acid, we know where they fall in the spectrum. And then when the product is manufactured through a reaction process, we're able to get what's in red. That's our fingerprint for that product. So when we look at our materials, everything is gonna pretty much overlay exactly where it's supposed to be. And then when we compare other products that claim to be similar to ours, there's always a way of finding out if there's a fallout. So what we see here, the CaCO3 is calcium carbonate. So when we look at that, we know that this product is an admixture. When you're making the chelate, what you do is we have these big jacketed tanks. And what we do is we put a soluble mineral in there and then we dissipate the anion. The, the ion is the mineral itself. The anion could be a hydroxide, it could be a carbonate, it could be anything. But what we need to do is we need to get that out of the way, totally flush out of the system, before we can put the amino acid there and make that reaction to create the dipeptide chelate bond. This here is a further comparison of the calcium. To be a true chelate, the ligand to the metal ratio is two to one. 
This material that we tested was 0.6 to 1, so we know it's not a chelate. The other thing that's important with calcium products is the lead content. Our material was 0.1 part per million, theirs was 3.3. With ours, there was no evidence of organic impurities. What we found with theirs was there was a presence of calcium carbonate. In addition, there was no evidence of separation of water of the ligand from the metal. And what we found there was evidence of separation of water from the ligand in the metal. So what that means is they basically blended an amino acid with a mineral salt created an admixture. Not the same thing. So concluding this, uh, our chelate has the chemical and spectral evidence of being a true chelate. And the other company's chelate shows it was unreacted calcium carbonate blended with a small amount of glycine, not a chelate, it's not even a glycinate salt. This is a uh, FTIR comparison of Ferrocal. Again, Ferrocal is our, probably our main product. Uh, this does very well in food fortification around the world. Everything from dairy products to yogurts to baked goods. Uh, we do a lot with it domestically in supplements, not only in the practitioner market that you're in, but also in the retail market and also in pharmaceutical uh, applications. So what we did here was looking at a comparison of our Ferrocal <clears throat> versus another company that claimed to make an iron chelate. And basically we found that there was a sulfate peak, which means it's a ferrous sulfate. And then there was no evidence of chelation based on the fingerprint lay over the material. So I'm comparing, comparing the two forms of the iron here, our Ferrocal is a two to one ratio. That's where it needs to be to be a chelate. Two moles of the amino acid to one mole of the mineral. This material was 0.7 to 1. No evidence of inorganic iron in ours, evidence of ferrous sulfate in their product. No other metal contaminations. This product that we examined showed an evidence of potassium. So it might have been either an instrument or a manufacturing that wasn't totally, totally clean. And then of course, no separation of the metal from ligand and water. And then the other product we found, uh, iron sulfate crystals recovered in separation and the, uh, the metal had separated from the ligand, so it was an admixture. Again, looking at this, uh, Ferrocal is a true amino acid chelate, no evidence of impurities, and then basically the other company was ferrosulfate, blended with a protein. This one here looks at zinc. Uh, our zinc product is a zinc bisglycinate chelate. It's a 20% elemental material. So what we looked at here was a competing zinc product and basically there was no evidence of chelation. There was a free amino acid. What this is basically telling us again, it's a salt that's just blended with a glycine. The end result of this was a two to one ratio for our material, 0.8 to one for theirs. Uh, both of these products had no evidence of inorganic impurities, which was good. Um, our lead content was very low, theirs was 2.0. And of course their material had separation of the metal and the ligand in water. Okay, this again just reiterates that, that past slide there where it's a true chelate, uh, free of inorganic contamination in lead, and the other material was a mixture of zinc oxide and a zinc lysine salt. This is looking at uh, lead contents in calcium. Uh, what it looks at, the state of California lead, that's, that's an upper limit, number 13.4. Of course, with Prop 65, that number is a lot less. But when we looked at the calcium, the lead in calcium in competing chelates, we found an average to be about 3.6 parts per million. Our material was uh, less than 0.1 part per million. So that's very good, particularly with calcium, because being a macro mineral, the dosage is a lot greater than what the elemental value is. Our material, if you're gonna have 100% of the RDI, our calcium is 18% elemental. So at 1,000 milligrams, you know, you're gonna have 555 milligrams uh, or 5.5 5 .5 grams of material to equal that 1,000 milligrams. So being lead-free or very low lead is very important. This is something looking at cadmium. One thing to look at is, uh, particularly with the GMPs and force, and there's additional testing on a lot of these minerals, is the heavy metal content. Cadmium is something that comes up a lot. So uh, when we look at our material, our products are ba basically void of cadmium versus other materials we looked at that were pretty high. And all this, start, all this really comes from is the starting material that you're using for the product. When we go out and we source our starting minerals, I mean, we may bring in, you know, five, 10, 15 different forms from different companies. 
And we're lucky if we find one or two that are actually clean enough for to use in, in our process. So there's a lot of, lot of questionable material that's out in the marketplace regarding any heavy metal content. Bottom line on our chelates, they're the most bioavailable. They're easy to tolerate, they're safe. All the LD50 studies we've done, they have 100% nutrient density. The entire ligand is gonna be used by the body. They're superior in physiological activity. They're non-interactive, non meaning they're not gonna compete for absorption with other minerals. And they have the proper stability constant to remain as they chelate through the acidity of the stomach and to be absorbed in the alkalinity of the intestinal tract. Yeah, what happens is um, not every mineral can be a chelate. And of course, to be a chelated mineral, it's got to be a di at least a divalent mineral. It's got to have two electrons because you're going to bond at least two amino acids to create a dipeptide structure. So there's three minerals that we make that cannot be chelated. One of them is selenium. Now, the problem with selenium is, is when you look at the outer ring structure to bond the second ligand, it's very hard to do that. So when we react that, the end result is a one-to-one -one ratio of selenium to glycine. It is a reactive product, but we cannot get a chelate structure out of it. So we call it selenium glycinate complex. The other two minerals that we, that we have that we do see in competing products, they are referred to as chelates, but they can't be chelated is boron and potassium. And the reason why they can't be chelated is because they're monovalent, they have one electron. So even when you're reactive, you're still, you have a one-to-one -one bond. You don't have the two-to-one bond to create the dipeptide structure to stabilize that material and make it easily absorbed. So the boron potassium couldn't be dipeptide because there's only one bond. There's one bond, right. Selenium, can you say? Selenium is because there's not enough room under ring structure to add a second electron. It's kind of an enigma as far as the minerals are concerned. So that would be uh, labeled as an amino acid complex? We, we call selenium a selenium glycinate complex. So all three of these products, like our boron, we call boron boronic glycine, and then our potassium is potassium glycinate complex. Yeah, we see that a lot. I mean, I mean, when I look at companies that I want to approach to try to do business with, if I look at their existing levels and see they're calling them chelates, I know they're not buying our material. I know it's from somebody else, and that gives me something to, uh, it gives me a good talking point when I go to present to them. And then can you explain the, the, the difference between selenium and selenium methionine? Well, selenium methionine, when they originally did selenium methionine, methionine years ago, to my knowledge, it was actually a reactive product, pretty much like the way we make our, our material. But what we see on the market right now, and this has been verified to me through people I know that work for the companies that currently sell selenium methionine, is basically it's a blend of sodium selenite or selenate with, with methionine. So there's no bond, there's no reaction. It's just a blended product. And so, again, it's an admixture, just like everything else. I, I don't know. I don't know if it's just, it, well, you know, the technology, I mean, what we do, I'm sure other people could try to duplicate. I mean, you know, the process is, is time consuming. Um, you know, you can't make the product in the day. It, it may evolve over a couple of days with a, with a proper reaction. And then you have to do a, a drying process, which we have a, you know, a spray dryer that we use. But, you know, when you're simply just taking any ingredients and blending them together, I tell people it's like making a cake. You just put the ingredients together. So it's, it's, uh, it's a lot different. Basically here, uh, on this slide here, uh, this just gives you an illustration of the, uh, the various patents that we've received. Uh, this, is, this is over the course of a 60 year history of being a company. And uh, it's, it's pretty predominant. They're not just United States patents, there's also international patents there. Uh, an interesting story, you know, our president of the company that just sold Albion, Dwayne Ashmead, uh, he was pretty much our ambassador around the world. We've done a lot of work with UNICEF and World Health Organization. We've done a lot of research with different companies like Procter & Gable and so forth in Latin America for the use of our, our mineral chelates and different food fortification. When you're dealing in, in populations like that, the most economical way to get nutrition to those people is through the food supply. Not very many of them can afford to go buy a bottle of supplements or something like that. But Dwayne was telling me a story one time that uh, he went to Israel and met with Anwar Sadat and had a really good, spent a few days with him. And when he got home, he got a phone call from Sadat saying, you know, thank you for coming and, and explaining what Albion does and we think it's gonna be a great benefit 
for our people. We were looking forward to working with you. And the next day he was assassinated. So Dwayne's story to us is I may be the last person that talked on the phone with Anwar Sadat, which was kind of interesting. But we've had a lot of people over the years um, that have been instrumental in human health that have been supportive of Albion. Christian Barnard was a big fan of Albion. Uh, before I went to work for the company, I've been with Albion 16 years now, I used to do contract manufacturing and the last human nutrition conference Albion had was uh, 1998. Uh, this was two weeks after Harvey passed away, Dwayne became the president. They decided to go on with the uh, human nutrition conference to honor Harvey and Christian Barnard was there in attendance and was the speaker for us. So it was kind of interesting to see the guy that did the first you know, heart transplant that was you know, a big fan of what we did and understand you know, the value of Albion minerals, not only around the world, particularly in, in South Africa. So. Rick, uh, there's a big thing that I see a lot on labels where they'll list the magnesium content, for example, right? And they'll say the magnesium is 100 milligrams, and then you look at, uh, you know, it's in one capsule, maybe a 10% compound, right? There's no way to get 100 milligrams of elemental. Can you explain a little more total weight versus elemental and how important it is? Well, when you take a look at magnesium, again, the high end of the spectrum is mag oxide, it's 52%, so your dosage is very low. You know, if you go to Walmart or somewhere like that and you buy a magnesium, it's going to be a mag oxide. You're probably going to get a thousand tablets for, you know, $6.95 or something like that. Our material, being a fully reacted chelate, and because of the limitations of the atomic mass or the total weight of the molecule, is only 10% elemental. So to have uh, 400 milligrams of magnesium, 100% of the RDI, you've got to use four grams of material. So what companies typically do with our product, if they're making a tablet, then they're gonna have 100% elemental magnesium per tablet. We would make that tablet weight 1,000 milligrams or one gram. So something like that, the dosage would be four tablets a day, maybe two in the a.m., two in the p.m. if you're trying to get somebody 100% of the magnesium equivalent on a daily basis. So you adjust the amount of the magnesium in elementally so that it's a therapeutic dose in the, in the capsule? Yeah. Yeah, it's 100 milligrams, but if you take four of those tablets a day, then you're going to get 100, 400 milligrams or 100% of the daily RDI. So it's just more, more of a dosage versus trying to get it all at once with a, a mag oxide or something like that. Uh, this is interesting. You know, Albion over the years has you know, had a, little, a few battles, you know, trying to validate what we make and, and again, validating all the science. So in 1977, uh, we actually sued the FDA, and they came back and they reviewed our materials and... They said, you know, based on the science you provide to us, we agree Albion makes a chelated mineral. And then over the years, the FDA has become a really good ally for us. Uh, our Ferrocal, which is used around the world in supplementation and food fortification, was uh, added to Codex Elementaris. And the way you get on there is through a government body and it was sponsored by the Food and Drug Association of the United States. So that's been very good for us. So, you know, we've done everything we can to validate that our materials are actually what they are and there is a benefit versus the common counterparts that are available in the marketplace. So in summarizing everything here, um, we have a lot of companies that compete against us. We do find a lot of our marketing material makes its way into their presentations, uh, which is you know basically borrowed science. Um, we manufacture amino acid chelates, guarantee absorption and bioavailability. Uh, we've proven that uh, our proprietary brand of chelates are safe through the LD50 studies. We know what the safe upper limit is, and we've proven that our menial acid chelates are effective, meaning they have good bioavailability. That's it. Thank you for your time. Is there any other questions on anything? Everybody's ready to go home, right? <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure they're getting some benefit, but the bioavailability of the zinc piconate is very low. And, you know, this was a study. The study that we, we saw that was conducted a couple years ago at Ohio State University was something that they, find, they funded to try to get an upper hand and boost the sales of that product. And, you know, basically it was worthless. You know, and when I look at zinc oxide, and if you tell me zinc oxide is better absorbed than zinc piconate, I mean, there's a big difference in cost of material and, and dosage and everything on that, too. Anything else? Great, thank you very much.